Speaking of love triangles, there was an easy solution for Rachel's problem in the Dark Knight. Why does she have to choose? Days with Bruce, nights with Harvey, everyone's happy. Wouldn't even interrupt Batman's schedule. Now why is this a joke instead of an option? Well, it's due mostly to today's topic, monogamy. A core principle of many romantic relationships, monogamy... Wait, why am I explaining this? You know what it means whether you practice it or not. People who do not adhere to the idea, while no longer ostracized from the community, are often distrusted by those who value the practice. It doesn't seem far-fetched to say that a married man speaking at length to a single woman might have less than innocent intentions. How does this play out when no marriage is involved, though? <sighs> huh? You're early this time. It's true, though. The follies of relationships is a huge reason why psychology has grown in popularity, especially after the sexual revolution. Yet despite the cultural shift, monogamy remains a strong desire for many when seeking heavy social commitments. Part of this is due to obvious trust issues, but beyond that, what would the neighbors think? How much influence do outsiders have in what goes on between consenting adults? Well, these issues and more are tackled in a film by Greg Araki, simply called Splendor. A classic tale. Girl meets boy, girl meets boy, girl falls in love with boys. It may seem like I'm jumping ahead, but this is how the movie opens. No prologue, no development, just two guys flanking the girl they love. In the nude. How much slumber could it get? Okay, I'm warning you now. If this makes you uncomfortable, this film may not be for you. Let's dive in. Meet Veronica, our main character and fledgling 20-something moving to LA from suburban hell. She and her friend Mike, the tampon box here, are going to a show. Mike has a thing for the bassist, and V finds her eyes lingering over Abel, who came dressed as Emo Phillips. Then Zed takes the stage, and my god is he a drummer's drummer. I think he only wears two shirts during the film. Now here starts the conundrum, where Veronica finds herself drawn between the contrasting personalities of the druggy writer and the heart of gold musician. Abel gets a phone number, Zed, well, Zed gets a little more. Given the opening three-way, it's pretty clear what Zed and V are going to do when she bypasses the line to the men's room, but the music here is a very different tone. Here's a hint. The guy who does the music for this movie also does most of the music for the show Dexter. Tonight's the night. Run! You know what? No point in the introduction of the boy toys is the possibility of either being taken brought up. So I guess the stereotype of starving artists being eternally available holds true in this universe, too. She leaves the party and her friend behind. The tampon box calls the next day, during the morning after portion of Veronica's decision. Anyhow, I get out of structuralist theory at five, so... Wait, she's in structuralist theory? No wonder I like her. She's an anchor for social observation plunked into the middle of all this. Mike represents a lot of things. For example, when V and Abel first meet, Mike is the voice of everyone else. Quick, cynical snark warning against giving your phone number out to a person you just met. However, she seems pretty cool about the one night stand, so... Speaking of that one night stand... Oh, sorry. There's wood every morning, I can't help it. He's the brains of the family. This moment of, my god, this is becoming softcore porn, is interrupted by Abel, giving his world-weary confession of poetic love for the girl he met less than 24 hours ago. Surprisingly, this lands him a date. Instead of actual dialogue, the date is mostly recapped by voiceover. This could symbolize that regardless of what was said, there was a natural atmosphere created which made both feel at home, as you couldn't with a near-perfect stranger. That, or the dialogue was considered lacking in post, and the editor had to save it with quick cuts. Anything's possible. Wait, something about this is starting to seem familiar. Hang on. DM? So, let me get this straight. You have 0.08 essence left, and you want titanium bone lacing? <laughs> sure. Whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger, right? Hey, welcome to the living wake. Let's see here, your character was, uh... You're reviewing something again, aren't you? Mm-hmm. A little film called Splendor. Never heard of it. Oh, I put it in your queue. It should be there by now. How did... Just watch it! So, what do you think? You know you're of age to buy porn, right? It's not pornography. You ain't kidding. I wanted to see if you got the same sense about the relationships that I did from this movie. What relationships? Well, the boy-girl-boy boy one. That wasn't a relationship. That was role-players role-playing a relationship. 
Go on. There's actors role playing a relationship, and then there's role players role playing a relationship. They hit every note you expect them to. Jealousy, contempt, all because, girl, she is mine! No, she is mine! They hate each other because they're supposed to. But then the characters meet to discuss this and. No, 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 no. There is no discussion. There's drinking, truth or dare, sex. That's how a party forms! What parties have you been to? Not that kind of party. A role playing party. You know, lawful good paladin, evil rogue, adventuring side by side. Impossible unless they're in a party. It's not a writing trick, it's a role playing one. They're together because, in order for the plot to progress, they have to be. Ah, so the glue of the film is crazy glue. Well, despite that weakness, the social observations still apply despite how the situation came about. A drunken three way? There are better ways to form a party. Unless we're role playing Sailor Moon. Hold that thought. Drunken three way. The issues of secrecy and deceit are rendered moot when Veronica bears all for the two. She actually does this before the convergence of the trio, when she's dating each separately, not hiding the fact from either party. After the date with Abel goes well, she tells him the truth of how she feels. After a scene pays similar to Unbreakable with half the point, Abel comes around to the idea of sharing. Somehow being completely open and honest about something so socially unacceptable makes a situation work. This is in sharp contrast to the inherent awkwardness of reality, where this kind of logic doesn't work. I figured if Abel was willing to share me with Zed, Maybe I could convince Zed to be open-minded about sharing me with Abel. Well, it was worth a try, right? Do you know how many deaths have followed that statement? Alright. You find yourself in the belly of the Platinum Dragon. Bubbling, spitting acid, slowly eating you away. And... You find a plus one longsword. Dibs! Veronica's young attempting to fill her pockets between acting gigs, and still seeing what path she wants to take in her life. Why not consider her options in men as well? She may be taking more lengthy, in-depth considerations than most would find prudent, but she's just being thorough. Scientists would approve. Shortly after the drunken epiphany, Abel and Zed move in, and here the consequences of Veronica's choices are fully realized. Twice the snoring most women have to deal with. What unrealistic way will the director segue out of this valid point? If you have true love in your life, that's all you need, you know? <laughs> Aww, honey, where did that come from? My heart. <coughs> you can make syrup from a line that sappy. 